Hello and welcome back to The Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be diving headfirst into the Whisper Rock proper and talking plenty about what I believe to be one of the last, if not the last, signature Walking Dead moments in the infamous border scene. As per usual at this point, the two versions continue to diverge to a yet unseen extent, so don't be too surprised if some characters do appear to be just teleporting around. It's just for the sake of drawing more direct similarities, and I'll mention the more confusing cases. But with that said, let us not waste any more time and dive right in. When we left off, Alpha had just revealed herself at the hilltop, following which Lydia was forced to return to the Whispers. And because our two boys, Carl and Henry, have fallen for her, in both versions they followed their trail, and so that is exactly where we'll pick up. And right from the get-go, the show takes a different turn in how all of this plays out. Because in the book, shortly after he begins following them, Carl is confronted by Alpha herself, where they immediately exchange some not-so-kind words. The show, on the other hand, has Beta be the one to catch Henry. And unlike Carl, who sort of just tags along himself, Alpha forces him to join their herd for the time being, just suspecting that there might be someone else following them. And this is one of those changes where I think the show really leveraged the benefit of hindsight. Because while Beta does play a huge role later in the comics as well, at this point in time, he hasn't even appeared yet. Whereas the show introduced him right alongside Alpha, which immediately added this overwhelming sense of power angle to the already terrifying aspect of the Schrodinger's Whisperers. And in a meta sense, if you were following the comics at the time, you'll know that some comic fans were often a little disappointed that characters like Negan and even Jesus were much smaller physically compared to their comic counterparts. And while yes, I do think it is a bit of a silly thing to get upset about, as there are not many actors out there who look like literal JoJo characters, but obviously it is something that also crept up with Beta, since he too was an absolute unit in the books. But I don't think it's a hot take to say that they nailed the casting on this one, and Ryan Hurst was absolutely terrifying as Beta. Oh, and also, the show remixed some of Beta's backstory. While in both versions he is very much a celebrity, in the comic he was a professional basketball player who later became an actor. While in the show, he was a musician going by the stage name Half Moon. Goofy lore aside though, in both versions Carl and Henry tag along with them and that is where we leave them for now. A huge remix for the show is everything surrounding Ezekiel. As I've said many many times already, the comic is always much more linear in the narrative it tells. And following the war, we don't really keep up with any other community aside from Alexandria and the Hilltop. And so, yes, the entire wacky Goofy search for the movie is 100% added for the show. And while I do think it is so weird and wacky that it does somewhat undermine the overall tone of the show, I am honestly not that bothered about it because I think it just sets up that heart-wrenching juxtaposition with the border even further. So while in the comic we had that hopeful tone of Maggie and Rick, the show just chose to leverage the overall goofiness that is Ezekiel and I kinda dig it to be honest. And okay, while I did just say that we don't really follow the other communities, Ezekiel does make a rare appearance, just in time for the fair. Cheeky old Kirkman. We see Rick and him bump into each other at the ocean side while Rick is returning from the hilltop. And yes, if you've been following extra closely, this is the first ever time in the comics where the ocean side is even properly mentioned, as opposed to the TV universe where it has been a thing ever since early season 7. But you know, it's also kind of been just that, a thing, it's not really ever important, so, you know. And like, I really want to wait until season 11 to talk about this, but the fact that their resolution was handled off-screen, out of the show, and Angela Kang literally just said what happened to them is like, what, what happened to season 11? Like, what is this? Oh my god. And also, yes, last time we already talked about Negan and Rick back at Alexandria, but timeline-wise, he still hasn't made it back. So again, fret not, there is no teleportation, I just did those out of order. All that aside though, we see them catch up on everything that's been going on, discuss trade, and basically just chill out, saying that this is probably the best place in the world for their trade partners to arrive late. And I just want to quickly re-emphasize what we've been discussing for much of Season 9. In the show, ever since the first time skip, there were always immediate troubles that needed to be sorted out. Be it the saviors and the bridge, or Gregory attempting to assassinate Maggie, even after the war, tensions were still very very high. And then after the second time skip, we see that the communities are more isolated than ever, and basically right away, the Whispers also make their debut. 
In the comic, on the other hand, this first half of the post time skip story really does open with us being at the greatest point we've ever been. And it's only as we keep going that literally everything comes crashing down at the same exact time. Everything surrounding Gregory, the Whispers, the internal turmoil between both Maggie and Rick, as well as very personal relationships like Eugene and Rosita. Every single one of these plot lines are about to converge in what is easily one of the most spectacular climaxes in the entire comic, in my opinion. And I think this last bit of piece from the very fittingly named issue from The Edge of the World is the perfect capstone to those illusions of safety that Kirkman had been laying out ever since the post time skip introduction. As to which version you prefer is clearly up to you, but just know that the overall tone differs an absolute ton. Though while they're chilling at the ocean side, their highly anticipated trade buddy finally arrives, as we get a full-on splash panel of the now pirate-embracing Michonne. For all of you TV onlys, the show does kinda sort of replicate this with Carol in Season 10, but it's not really the same and I would just call it a inspiration more than anything else. But yeah, we will address all that next time, so just don't worry about that now. And a couple of things to tackle before you reunite with our new pirate captain. Just like for us as the reader, Rick also knows how Michonne just up and vanished after the war. So yes, don't worry, you weren't losing your marbles. She did indeed just go off on her own little side quest to sort of find herself. Also, like I've mentioned before, some of her story during this time is explored further in the Telltale games, which I do plan on replaying on stream sometime soon, TM. Twitch.tv forward slash Crotos Mystery Shack, by the way. That part of the story is technically canon, but it's a bit here and there, so just don't worry about it too much, it's nothing too important. As for Ezekiel, remember that he and Michonne had a relationship going in the books. And even though a long time has passed since they last saw each other, and he clearly has no clue what's even going on with her, our boy is sweating big time. And unfortunately for him, she does brush him off straight away, asking whether there really was no one else they could send. With Rick on the other hand, she does have quite a lengthy conversation, both tackling her inner turmoil around everything they've been through and how she still feels lost, as well as the survivor's guilt she feels over her children, which is of course something that'll become very very important with the Commonwealth. And because Rick is very much embracing his funny old friendly man persona, she also teases him over calling her his best friend, asking whether he is ten or something for throwing out these arbitrary friendship classifications. Though generally, all of this is just showing us the sheer size of the joint network they've established, and what Rick's role is now that the fighting is done, very neatly setting us up for all of that to come crumbling down. Meanwhile at the hilltop, the entire Gregory debacle continues much like it did with the TV version. As I've already mentioned, at this point in the comic, Jesus is Maggie's number one advisor. So he is right there by her side as they try to figure out what do we even do with him. At first, Maggie echoes Rick saying that they can't just kill him, it would go against everything Rick fought for. Negan was made out to be an example for a reason after all. Though Jesus counters her by saying, with Gregory, things are different. When Negan was in prison, they weren't also surrounded by Negan's loyalists. With Gregory on the other hand, even if he is locked up, the danger he poses to Maggie is still there, if not even greater. And so following this point, they have a mini-investigation of sorts where they question everyone involved and just weigh their options on how to proceed. Again, because the fair is just around the corner, and don't forget, Maggie now also has to deal with the fact that Carl has just up and disappeared, there is just a lot on her mind to consider. In the show, on the other hand, because of Lauren's and Andrew's exits, this whole plotline was massively sped up, and there was very little deliberation of what this move signals to the point that Rick himself is even there to watch the entire thing go down. You know, almost as if Carl dying to achieve this whole we have to save Negan and stop killing thing was completely pointless, as Rick just stood <coughs> by as they sent Gregory on a bungee jump. Huh. If only there was a comic as a perfect blueprint and why Rick sparing Negan makes perfect sense, huh? And the turmoil that then causes, huh? Still talking about the book, we see Rick finally return to Alexandria where they're intercepted by Dwight, who wants to talk to Rick. And it's this where the whole Daryl leading the Saviors thing is lifted from earlier in the season. With Dwight too being here to talk about how he no longer wants to lead the Saviors. In the show, obviously the Sanctuary no longer exists, and Dwight set off for Fear the Walking Dead, so none of this happens by default. In the book, though, he sort of became the leader simply because he was there to pick up Lucille and tell everyone to stand down at the end of the war. And so Rick points out that it's not him who delegated him to the Sanctuary or anything, it's rather a case of the Saviors themselves picking Dwight as their leader. 
Finishing by saying, if he wishes to step down, he should simply address them properly and simply announce that they should re-elect a new leader. As you might already suspect, because this is Kirkman, obviously this teeny little spark of disruption will lead to basically full-blown conflict, but more on that when we get there. As for Rick, he returns back to Alexandria and of course heads right on over to Negan's cell to make sure everything is in order. Which is when we get the whole Negan chilling with the gates open part we talked about last time. And oh boy, hope you're ready for Ruthless Rick to make a return. We then jump on over to Rosita, announcing that she and Eugene are having a baby, which is of course a lie to avoid drama as the baby is Sadiq's. But much, much more importantly, after Rick congratulates Eugene, he immediately asks, Have you seen Olivia? And yes, it is exactly what you think. He calls her to the side and says, Look around. See all those people out there? All of them are f dead. You know how? Because of you, Olivia. Rick straight up pulls an air in here, and in the most cold, dead stare tone possible, recounts what just happened in the cell, and then asks, Do I even need to tell you what will happen if this happens again? Obviously, Olivia breaks down in tears, and Rick just tells her to get out of here and not cause a scene. So yes, once again, you can see the drastic difference in Rick's character post-time skip. Just like we talked about with the bridge arc, while he never had lost his edge, there is a very, very good argument to be made that Rick was very naive. Negan literally spelled out exactly what would end up happening with this little perfect dream. And welcome to the new segment I just made up called Comment of the Week, where one of you put it quite bluntly. So the show tried to make Negan more likable by making Rick incompetent in his leadership. And while I do think that's a bit of an extreme way of putting it, it's not really completely false either, especially with him also being quite selective about how they enforce their rules regarding Gregory. And to contrast all of this to the book, Negan also spells out what Rick will do, but not to belittle him. He does not call him weak or try to dispel his naive dreams. He does the complete opposite. He calls Rick ruthless and a monster. And to hammer that point home even further, we then cut to Rick and Andrea getting ready for bed and talking about everything that happened with Olivia and with Negan in general. Rick explains the whole door situation to her, and then adds that he probably still wasn't hard enough on Olivia, since she's also meant to check in on Negan in the evenings, something she clearly hadn't done. And after hearing this, Andrea adds, yeah, it's definitely too risky to keep Negan here which Rick immediately shuts down, asking her to just not start this again. They tease each other for having their little protagonist moments, but Rick does go on a little speech of sorts, which ends with, We are civilized people. If we go back to killing simply to survive, all of this starts to fall apart. Which is then directly preceded by this. So, yeah. Kirkman very much chose chaos, and for the 300th time, this abrupt smash cut to completely subvert what Rick is saying is probably a good indicator of us moving closer and closer to the edge. And before we follow up with all of that, let us jump on over to Henry and Carl with the Whispers. In both versions, we see their camp and begin to delve a little deeper in how they operate, though soon thereafter, the TV show takes another massive departure. In the book, almost right away, Carl explicitly confronts Alpha about the things that have happened to Lydia, even going as far as to call her out about dancing around the subject. Alpha is obviously a tad displeased, but so far, she appears to be a totally blank slate with seemingly no emotional capacity whatsoever. The show, on the other hand, moves up the whole challenging Alpha bit, and right away, we see that some of the other whispers are questioning what her motives were for going after Lydia obviously implying that she is weak and pursued her for selfish reasons. The only thing I'd mention here that once again sticks out to me as super odd is Henry, because compared to Carl, he honestly seems like a pretty major buffoon. Apparently my Judith take and how she is written to be a grown-up in a child's body was controversial, but the fact that she appears to be more mature than Henry still boggles my mind. To me, it almost seems like the writers were like, a kid grown up in the apocalypse. Yes, they're definitely very traumatized, let's make them a gigachad. Oh, we're supposed to write a teenager? Well, hormones in it, they're just dumb. Have Henry tell Lydia everything about their communities, why not, it's no big deal, right? Don't get me wrong, Carl is hot-headed to absolutely no end, that much is certain. But with him, I feel like it's rather a matter of, I will die fighting all of you, I seriously just don't care. Whereas with Henry, at least I always felt that it's a case of, 
Oh yeah, I'll go in there, reunite with my new girlfriend, and we will leave with no troubles whatsoever. It'll be sunshine and rainbows with no repercussions whatsoever. It'll be great. If I were to summarize all of this as quickly as I can, in the comic, we have the scene of Alpha telling Carl to not forget that he is a prisoner. To which Carl responds by asking, Oh, that's what this is? I'm being held captive? Whereas Henry is, well, tied to a tree. But whatever the case, Henry's stuff aside, the biggest thing for me here is that even now in the books, while the Whispers are clearly horrible people, they still didn't feel like explicit antagonists just yet. As I've said before, that might come down to there being fewer degrees of separation, as again, seeing it acted out in live action obviously just carries a much different tone. But this entire section of the story just felt a lot more spookier and tense in the show, with Alpha being a 300% baddie already. And that is further proven by the fact that their camp is already attacked by Daryl, which again, I feel like subverts Henry's character even further because he is now explicitly being saved, but okay, I digress. The whole Daryl Connie mission is kinda sorta what we see in the book, but it is also a major departure. Obviously in the comic too, Maggie sends out Dante to search for Carl. But that search proves unsuccessful, with him returning a few days later and saying that he already went far outside of their borders. The show on the other hand, once again sends out a huge heavy hitter in Daryl. And not only is their search successful, it already works as the first explicit shots fired in this upcoming conflict. Of course, it's not like we haven't already fought. But to me, that was sort of a fight in ignorance. Now, on the other hand, everyone knows who each other is, so now an attack is much more formal. Another major remix here is Daryl already using the Whisperer strats and going in with a mask. Something that doesn't happen in the book until we're right into the thick of the war. Though an even greater remix is everything that happens after they get out Lydia. They find their way into this office building, hoping to separate the Whispers from the Walkers. But of course, Beta, who, again, isn't even introduced in the book yet, is sent after them and we get to see what is one of the most <laughs> metal fights of all time. I've mentioned it already, but I do very much think that the connie Daryl duo is one of the best things to come out of all the TV add-ins. So it should come as no surprise that I do think this little joint mission was absolutely awesome. And clearly, their stand against the Whispers here was also incredible, with Beta being the clear highlight in all of this. The only nitpick I'd raise here, which again just comes down to the macro story and how it all unravels, is that it feels sort of odd already having these full-blown battles before the border scene. As I always read it, as this absolutely incomprehensible act of violence that briefly just stops any hope of resistance whatsoever. It was exactly because we never even fought them yet that I think that complete shock came out of nowhere. Which I do suppose you can also tie in with how Negan's introduction was handled in the show. You mow down countless people, but when you face consequences, you're a Pikachu face. I think it just sort of undermines the core point of it. But whatever the case, like I said, the sequence as a whole is excellent, and them pushing up Beta was 100% the right call in my opinion. And also, also, I definitely have to mention the character dynamics at play here. Because I've mentioned the whole Daryl-Connie dynamic and how it brings out the best of Daryl's character, with him having to be much more present in the conversations they have. But I've yet to mention what is perhaps my favorite detail in all of this. And that is the immediate bond that develops between him and Lydia, and later also between Lydia and Carol. Because unfortunately, they all have one thing in common. They know and recognize abuse. This is one of those more subtle character-centric things where the adaptation does really win it out over the book. Because it's no longer a matter of doing what's right or anything like that. They simply cannot help but see a part of themselves in Lydia and clearly they want to put an end to it. And um, so we've talked about some really cool stuff right now, but this next section of the video in my script was literally just brackets, TV, the highwaymen, brackets closed, no one cares. But alright, let us talk about the Highwaymen. Big surprise, obviously this bunch does not exist in the book at any point in time. And let's be honest here, half of you don't even remember they existed and they are there as the laziest bit of filler imaginable. Made worse by the fact that 1. They share a name with one of the coolest bands of all time, and 2. They just have a name that sounds really really cool. But yeah, I ranted about the trash people enough, so you probably know my thoughts on this pointless fluff already. But on the bright side, they at least also contributed literally nothing to the narrative, so I guess it's about as good as it gets. 
That aside though, another neat addition for the show is the entire flashback we get with Michonne and her old friend Jocelyn. From a practical standpoint, yes, it is obviously there to crowbar in an explanation for the whole isolation of the communities, and the whole cult of children stuff does somehow turn out to feel more comic booky than the comic book, but I do still think it was a really cool bit of added story, which just works to flesh out that completely unprecedented time skip of seven-ish years. Okay, but like seriously, they adapted the Halloween from like way, way back in Alexandria in the comic book, so let's be real here, it is automatically a 10 out of 10. Especially because it isn't your typical external threat, but rather something so much more insidious. However, if this is the event that made Michonne so protective of Judith, why is she running around on her own? So yeah, nothing groundbreaking, but definitely a cool little flashback to accompany the already completely twisted story of the present day. Because let's be real here, this is easily some of the darkest stuff the TV version has ever had. And with that, let us get into the absolute climax of the season, because yes, it is time for the fair. Again, a major difference here right from the get-go is that the fair in the comics takes place in Alexandria, as opposed to the kingdom in the show. Also, in the comic, there is no drama between the communities and basically all of them are said to attend. And here, we get another great juxtaposition in the book, as we see Andrea begin to cry as she sees all the fair stands going up. That is then sharply opposed by Maggie making her speech following Gregory's hanging. Though with that, Maggie too sets off for the fair. And as she arrives at Alexandria, we see yet another great juxtaposition. We see the bustling streets of the fair, only for us to then sharply cut to Rick being debriefed about the whispers. Keep in mind that everything we've talked about thus far has only ever revolved around the hilltop. So this is literally Rick's first time hearing about all of this. And as he's already on the back foot, clearly being stunned by the prospect of people wearing walker masks, Maggie then drops the bombshell. Carl is gone too. Obviously, this immediately enrages him, and he simply demands that she tell him how long has it been, where is he? Saying he doesn't care Maggie has a lot on her plate or anything. Though Jesus cuts in saying, Gregory tried to kill her, which of course forces Rick to take a step back for a moment and apologize. But he then says that he needs to get Andrea up and that they are going after him. As for the show though, we have a bit of a remix. Similar to the book, they too begin wondering about where Daryl, Henry and the others are. But just as they are about to head out, the gates open and they arrive back completely unharmed. With even Michonne and Judith tagging along as well. And of course, we also have a super wholesome scene of everyone reuniting. Judith saying that she still remembers all of them, etc, etc which also just continues to set up that brutal 180 at the tail end of this episode. And also fun fact, which to be completely honest with you, isn't even that fun since it does bring up some alarming questions. Reportedly, the reason why the fair happens in episode 15 and not the finale is because Angela Kang didn't want to have a filler episode. And because she wanted to deliberately play with her expectations, the fair was pushed to be the penultimate episode. As we've discussed many times before, I do think it's definitely a huge win in my book as the whole 18916 formula had definitely grown stale at this point. But at the same time, we literally just talked about the Highwaymen, which were just about the most blatant form of filler imaginable. And to top it all off, clearly surprising absolutely no one, this is clearly a 100% confirmation that these big moments are deliberately reserved for finales, rather than just writing the story organically and seeing where they land. And don't get me wrong here, it makes perfect sense. You need to plan the season beforehand, right? You're not just going to wing it. But let me rephrase what I just said, because that then brings up the ever important question of, do we even need 16 episodes then? This has been a talking point for a very, very long time in the community and is one I mean to return to at some point, so I won't ramble on about that now. Just thought that this little tidbit of information from Kang was definitely eyebrow raise worthy. But in story, we see the whole Alliance re-declaration as everyone's caught up on the Lydia drama, which, again, is an excellent case of building up hope before crashing it all down. But the obvious big difference here is that they will now deliberately leave the fair and that's when they're caught by the Whispers. Whereas in the comic, it's just Rick going to search for Carl. Actually, no, you know what? Ignore everything I've said. This single scene here makes the TV version infinitely better. Jokes aside though, in both versions we see Alpha pop up during the fair, though a massive remix here is the whole double timeline thingy we see. In the book, as per usual, the whole thing plays out in a linear fashion which we'll get to in a second. 
While the show obviously starts with Henry and Lydia being at the fair, something that never happens in the book and you simply piece together what's going on from there. And speaking of which, let us tackle the book's version so we can start drawing more concrete parallels. After learning that Carl is missing, Rick gathers his OG squad and they head out with Dante leading their way. And timeline-wise, it's exactly as Rick heads out that we cut to Alpha within the fair. Though somewhat similar to the show, they are then intercepted by a group of whisperers and Rick alone is called out to follow them. He's brought to Carl and Lydia and emotions start running high on absolutely all fronts. Rick is clearly fed up with Carl's antics and tells him that he will drag him out if needed. But Carl cuts back saying that Lydia is the only person in the world to ever look at him normally, saying the now very signature line of, this world is my father and I've got its looks, pointing to his eye and saying that it is clear that everyone basically just thinks it's disgusting. And while this is going on, Alpha herself also arrives, holding a bloody machete saying that she ran into some trouble. Being alarmed by this, Rick obviously just asks, what did you do? And then begins to threaten her, saying that if anything happened to Andrea and the others, but he is promptly cut off by a good old whack to the face, following which Alpha makes it very, very clear. He is in no position to threaten her. Similarly, in the show, she mentions how Lydia was weak, which prompts a similar response from the captive group, and then she picks out Daryl to follow her. In both versions, she talks about how their way of life is gone, that they have nothing to offer her and that basically she doesn't consider them as a threat. But all of that culminates in the big oh boy scene as Rick, or Daryl in the show, is led to the seemingly infinite tsunami of walkers to show just how serious they are. And again, I want to re-emphasize this. In the book, we are not on war terms just yet. No one has explicitly attacked anyone. So I still remember that I turned the page and I was like, oh, so this is the ultimate form of deterrence, isn't it? The walker she has here is basically the walking dead version of a nuclear bomb. If they point it in a direction, nothing will be left. And in case you weren't following the comics at the time, when they were originally coming out, we got the issue covers and titles in advance, which everyone would use to theorize about what's to come next. And imagine the community's reaction when we saw this. And then the next thing to come out is the issue simply titled dot dot dot, with the cover just being a close up on Rick's face. Yeah, things were about to explode in spectacular fashion. In both versions, they are told about some sort of border marking, which Alpha then follows up with, don't worry, you will see it, I'm sure of that. And in the comic, just before Rick can leave, he once again tries speaking to Carl and getting him to go. Which is when he reveals the things that happened to Lydia, basically asking, you really expect me to ignore that? Reacting to this, of course Rick too basically calls her a monster. But Alpha then breaks down in tears, hitting Lydia across the face, and then telling Rick that she can't offer her daughter safety here, but that he can. Which yes, as you'd expect, also made many people, including me, once again just ask who the oh. is this lady and is she even meant to be an antagonist? But yes, she gives them one last warning, saying that if they cross into their land, her horde will cross into theirs. The show plays out largely the same following this point, only in the book we are first led to believe that something might have happened to Andrea and the others, while the show just has all of them meeting up basically right away. Though with that, they cross the hill and they see it. The border which certainly no one would miss and oh boy, what is there even to say here? Reading this in the comic just broke my brain and seeing it play out in the show still hit seemingly just as hard, with it replicating those one by one reveals to a T. And then of course giving us that one huge one in Ezekiel or Henry in the show. And while I could talk about the somewhat confusing decision to kill off Henry here, I more so want to talk about Melissa's performance here, because man, that scene of Daryl noticing the head and then just holding her back, pure perfection. And that violin, oh boy, the music here is excellent. No! 
In the comic, we also have a very similar scene in Michonne seeing Ezekiel, which also gives us a very tragic embrace between her and Rick. But obviously, in both versions, everyone here is just broken. The moments is just hollow. They simply stand there and there is nothing any of them can do. And if that isn't a perfect Walking Dead feeling, then I really don't know what is. Deaths-wise, they are also quite a bit different, with the likes of Tara and Henry clearly being TV exclusive. But we will get to the whole repercussions of this whole ordeal a lot more with Season 10. Point is that, while this was clearly another case of me not really knowing how the moment truly felt in the TV version, when I turned the page in the comic and saw those heads, I mean, all bets were off. This wasn't Negan picking one person. These were 12, obviously of varying importance, but still characters we knew very well. And the absolutely worst parts? We just heard that Rosita is pregnant. We just saw the entire emotional turmoil Eugene went through in accepting the child as his own. So in addition to those 12, yes, there is also that. And yes, this is also why I said to remember that Rosita is pregnant. That entire plot thread in the comic was all just leading to this breaking point. Just like we saw with Judith in the prison, it just crushes any and all hope for the future. But yes, that is Kirkman for you. And again, I want to restate this again because it's so important. In the comic, no battles had happened just yet. So we now have a infinitely powerful weapon in the Walker nuke, as well as definitive proof that Alpha can easily slip into their ranks and pick off a dozen people without breaking a sweat. Not as an act of war, but as a threat. If that is not the most ridiculous villain of all time, then I really don't know what is. And also fun fact, some very smart people noticed that if you arrange the names of the victims in the TV version, their first initials spell out Art of Death. But Angela Kang jokingly confirmed that, unfortunately, this is a case of her wishing she could come up with something so cool. And that this is simply a coincidence that the fans have picked up on. But in story, oh boy, don't you think this is over just yet? Because as Rick addresses the communities and we find ourselves once more mourning the lost, we still have a very important unresolved plot thread. And I really wanted to mention this panel of the fair being completely desolate, but I couldn't really fit it in anywhere. But yes, just look at it. It's really, really cool. Tell me it doesn't look like super depressing. I love it. But as these surviving family members all scream at Rick to just do something to pick up arms and storm into their lands, we finally see the final powder keg go off as Rick learns that Maggie executed Gregory. And at this point, he just snaps, screaming and beating back anyone and everyone around him. Screaming that this just happened and now this, everything they've been working for, is crumbling down in front of his eyes. Though after Maggie almost punches Rick unconscious, they all just finally sigh and basically say, we are not ready for this. And as Rick walks home, we just see that the entire community is simply glaring at him. The show, on the other hand, just pulls a complete 180 and suddenly gives us snow for the very, very first time, which frankly just makes me even more mad because why the f did we have to wait so long? Admittedly, a bunch of you from the US have said that the early comic weather really makes no sense as it never gets that cold around Atlanta and Georgia, but I'll be honest with you, I don't care. I like snow. Give me more snow in my apocalypse show, okay? Snow is cool. Snow adds an entire dimension of survival. Give me more snow. Why is there no snow? Please, instead of making the 50th spin-off, how about we make a new show that is set in a different climate? Think about that, AMC. Jokes aside, yes, 100% of this is added for the show. Everything from the kingdom falling, which also neatly ties back with Henry keeping the place together in early season 9, to this blizzard, all of this is TV show exclusive. Negan is never let out, he never saves Judith, and unfortunately, there is also no tragically beautiful and peaceful snowball fights. No, but like for real, can we please stop it with the random spin-offs? Just give me a different show with different characters in a different climate with a different story. I mean, imagine this. We see the winter set in, scavenging becomes difficult, they have no food, they're on the brink of starvation. And so, this new group becomes villains. The story writes itself here, come on. Though yes, on that very tragic note, that is season 9 and the table has now been set for the inevitable war on the horizon. 
I do still wish to return to the border scene at a future date, as I think there is plenty more to be said around the sheer magnitude of the reveal. But right now, I would honestly just love to hear your reactions to how it all went down. Whether you were there reading the comment as it came out, or saw the show, what went through your mind at that moment? Personally, I think the issue title of dot 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 sums it up quite well for me. But anyway, with that, I hope to see you back next time where we'll begin to dive into the somewhat messy season 10 and move into the get ready for this penultimate season of The Walking Dead. And that's the video. Well, here we are at the very precipice of The Walking Dead's endgame. Okay, over-dramatized announcements aside, something tells me seasons 10 and 11 will take quite a long while to get through, so I think we'll be here for quite some time. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest member of the team, Rod Roder. Sorry if I butchered the pronunciation. But without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!